Good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access their committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. I'd like to welcome Sandra White, MSP, today to the committee. Uh, Sandra White, do you have any relevant interest to declare? Only the, uh, the art schools have an interest and it's in my constituency. Thank you. Apologies have been received from Tavish Scott, MSP. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking <coughs> items three and four in private. Are members agreed? Our main item of business today is an evidence session on the Glasgow School of Art fire. Uh, the committee's work is focused on the management and custodianship of the Macintosh building and its collections. Uh, and our committee is also examining the future of both the building and the collections. Uh, this is our second evidence session on the art school. Um, our next session will take place on the 19th of November uh, with Glasgow School of Art uh, board members. Uh, before we begin, um, I want to remind members and uh, witnesses that we have a limited amount of time today. And as you can see, we've got quite a number of members uh, wishing to ask questions. So if the questions and answers could be kept as succinct as possible, uh, that would be extremely useful. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today to the committee. They are Brian McQuaid, the Managing Director of Keir Scotland. Uh, and from Page and Park Architects, we have David Page, the Director, and David Payton, the Head of Design Review. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you for um, your written evidence, uh, which was helpful. Uh, Mr McQuaid, I understand you wish to make a short opening statement. Yes, that's OK. Um, yes, yeah, so it can be as short as possible. Yeah. Very brief. Um, first of all, good morning and, and thanks, convener, for the invitation to appear before you today. Um, I appreciate the, the, the opportunity to make some brief uh, opening remarks before we start answering the questions this morning. We really just wanted to speak on behalf of everyone at Keir Construction um, and expressing how saddened we were uh, and are by the fire which took hold at the Glasgow School of Art in June with the devastating consequences. As you know, we were appointed by the School of Art uh, to lead the reconstruction works of the Macintosh building back in uh, June 16, following the fire that occurred in May 14. It was a commission which our team was extremely proud of uh, securing. We recognised the importance of the MAC to the students, uh, to Glasgow and to Scotland and the art world as a whole. And for the last two years, our people have been working painstakingly and putting all their um, efforts into the restoration work. And then it was within sight, um, we could see 10 months um, away we would be handing uh, the building back over. Everyone at Keir, as well as the, the, the team of skilled craftspeople in the supply chain, uh, cared deeply for what we were doing at the, the MAC. We were looking very, very much forward to completing the major restoration work, um, which we hoped would instill um, pride in the work that was done for Glasgow and indeed all of Scotland. Like everyone else, we await the outcome of the investigation that's ongoing. Uh, and uh, I'd like to assure the committee that uh, through the proceedings, we continue to do what we can to assist the fire service and other uh, investigating bodies. I hope you'll understand there's a, a live regulatory investigation underway. Um, and I don't want to say anything today that might interfere or prejudice with that investigation. Um, you'll be aware there is a joint names insurance policy taken out by Glasgow School of Art for damage to the renovation works and the existing structure and that covered uh, liability for, or legal liability for third party property damage. So I've got to be mindful um, not to say anything which could compromise those insurance provisions today. So uh, given both those factors, I might not be able to answer all the questions that you may want to put today. Um, but speaking for Keir, I can't tell you when the um, inquiry will come to an end and when we'll, we'll know. And I appreciate this is recognized. Um, I hope we can, assist you in the, the, the session today, and we'll, we'll, we'll make every endeavour to do that and give you as much information as we can. Okay. But thanks for that. Thank you very much. And I understand um, that, um, is it Mr Page wants to make a statement? Just a short statement. Just short. Yeah. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to answer your questions today. Just like this committee and everyone who cares deeply about the Glasgow School of Art, we have been completely devastated by the catastrophic fire in June. Page Park is an employee-owned company based in Glasgow, close to the Glasgow School of Art. We have 40 employees, and at least a third of them were involved at any one time on the work of the Glasgow School of Art. A number of our team were educated at the GSA, and our chair was one of those. 
It was an incredibly important contract for us to win, and we have always been and remain extremely proud and humbled to have been working on the, one of the world's most important historic buildings. We, like everyone else in this committee in Glasgow and across Scotland and beyond, want to know what happened, and we await the outcome of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service investigation. So we look forward to assisting you in your deliberations. Thank you uh, very much for that. Can I, can I open um, by... Um, well, we know um, from the uh, fire report of the 2014 fire that the fire escalated because of the ventilation ducts uh, in the building. And uh, reading through your very helpful timeline that you submitted, you have been associated, as you say, uh, as architects with the, the art school for 25 years. Um, Reading th through your timeline, it was clear um, that uh, there had, there's been a, a major project work done back in 20, uh, 2008 that was Heritage Lottery funded, uh, and that would have been the opportunity uh, to deal with that problem with the, with the duct. And this came up in, in evidence from a, a previous witness se session uh, as well. Um, now, in your timeline, you say that, that, that you do seem to indicate that, that this was you had an engineer in to look at the fires uh, stopping in the building, and this was identified back then. But uh, it was it basically you say that it, it was not possible um, because of the extent of fire stopping needed that you decided not to go down the route of doing that and instead the focus was on a sprinkler system, which of course wasn't installed by the 2014 fire. Why, why did you agree to that engineer's report that suggested that it, the extent of the stopping was so great that it wasn't possible to do it? The, the, uh, we understand the question. Um, uh, in 2008, as, as we've, we've said, the GSA commissioned the report out of concerns. Um, and and uh, fire engineer Fedra um, worked with the ourselves said, yeah. on, on that. They, what they did was they looked at the building very closely. Um, and what they said was that risk reduction, the usual risk re reduction measures were not possible for three reasons. One, the, the use of the building couldn't be changed. The construction, the particular construction of the, of the building couldn't be changed. And there was a remaining the possibility of a fire. So, and in particular on fire stopping, what they said was they concluded that it was virtually impossible given the current structure and amount of fire stopping and compartmentation required to achieve, uh, to achieve that. So, their conclusion after looking at all the, the possible remedies and solutions was that there was only one conclusion, and that was missuppression. That's the only viable option that they identified. And, this, and, sorry, and that obviously left the, the, these voids in place, which accelerated the fire. Yep, I think the, the intention was that once the missuppression went in, it would deal with all of these. So if, if the only fire measure uh, was, was the suppression sprinkler system, why did it take from 2008 to 2014 uh, to get it in place, and it still wasn't in place at the time of the fire? The missuppression system was a completely new system to put into an operational historic building. The problem with inserting such a system is it's incredibly complicated. And it's, you're, you're wanting to conserve the fabric, but you're having to pass pipes through the spaces that you value. So that was a major challenge for everyone, including the statutory authorities. And I think we mentioned on our timeline, a workshop was arranged, when the statutory authorities were supportive of what was essentially a pioneering installation into an incredibly important world historic building. The journey to get there took, took time because it's very complicated. There was two insurers involved, one for the building and one for the collections that sat within the building. There were 150 different rooms and every single room was different in size and shape. So the process took time. The money had been expended on the conservation and access project so that funding had to be raised. And at the same time, the program to, to, to make it, to, install it while the building was in operation had to be created. 
there was a huge amount of challenges that that the, the art school faced in terms of that installation. It was clearly an issue then in terms of not installing it right away. Well, the funding is always in, we found in arts and culture and conservation projects, it's always an issue. Okay. Just to go back to, like, you're talking about the, the fire stopping and compartmentation, uh, which decided uh, was not possible in 2008. After the 2014 fire, um, did that change? Did your view on fire stopping and compartmentation change? After the 2014 fire? Absolutely. Um, because what we were then in, into was a, a completely different situation. Um, up until then, work had been going on, um, as all the universities do, during summer periods. And then in the case of the, the, the fire um, uh, suppression system, that was one continuous um, project. But what we had then was a chance to... to properly consider um, the, uh, the events of the fire and put into place a comprehensive system for uh, the building in, in use in the future. And, and there were five key um, uh, targets that were identified as we worked uh, together with our, our fire consultants. That was, uh, as, you, as you can imagine, improve the, the compartmentation of the building um, install fire stopping, yes, uh, within all the ducts and risers. Install a, 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 a state-of-the-art detection system um, through the building. Install a mist suppression system, which um, had, had, had been commenced previously. And install a smoke extract system. So it, it was not a single um, measure. It was a whole range of measures to protect this, this most important building. Right. And you've listed these in the, the compartmentation and the fire stopping. Was that written into the contract, the tender? Absolutely. The, the tender, um, uh, the documentation that the team pre prepared required the contractor to put all of these into installation. Okay. And of course, we, we had the situation where the, the, the sprinkler system, we had exactly the same situation with the sprinkler system as we had in 2014. It wasn't in place at the time of the fire. Uh, sp sprinkler systems are, as David uh, has already alluded to, are complex uh, processes. Um, it was uh, uh, in installation and by the end of the contract, of course, would have been commissioned and, and in place. Right. Could I, could I, it's important to distinguish to, to, to help the, the, the committee, the difference between the two fires. One was a fire in use for which those five uh, fire prevention measures were, were, were put forward. The other one was a fire on a construction site for which there are different processes and procedures that, were, that, that are followed. They are, they, they, are, they are different. Yeah, and there are particular risks there during are, there, there, construction. There are risks which are, which, which there are yeah. processes and procedures put in place to yeah. Mitigate, but, I mean, mitigate it, those risks. Yeah. An average person looking at it would, 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 would see it as extremely unfortunate that in both fires you were just about to put in a fire sprinkler system. Yeah, I, would agree. I, I, can't, I can't disagree. <laughs> it's, it's a repetition of the previous mistake, but um, I know that there are other members keen to come in, so I'm going to move on to Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, so I'm interested in the role of Glasgow School of Art. So the Board of Governors Estates Committee had the role of overseeing the, um, the project, the restoration project. And in the evidence we've had um, from Page and Parks, um, you've said that at the commencement of the works, Keir Construction prepared and issued a fire and emergency plan um, that was extensively consulted on at the time. So can I ask what the, from, from the issuing of the tenders and except that and Keir's involvement from 2016 up until the recent fire, what kind of discussions did you have with Glasgow? What would you say the extent of Glasgow School of Arts oversight of the project was? Were they quite intimately involved in the project going forward or was it a fairly hands-off and Keir and yourselves were responsible for the project? Can I just answer the first point in terms of in involvement? The Glasgow School of Art appointed both internal specialist con uh, project managers and external project managers, and they acted as the interface with the board. So on day to day, we were in constant dialogue. As you can imagine, this project was in high visibility. And so the, the, the level of the discussion 
was constant. It's also a conservation project. You move a few feet along a wall and there's another issue. So there's a constant dialogue that takes place. So there was no way that that took place in isolation. That took in place in constant dialogue with those project manager representatives of the, of the art school. Okay. I, I, if I might address the other part of, of your, your question, which I, I think was about the consultation uh, and involvement of the GSA in, in the contractor fire plan. Uh, what I, I would say is that the, what we required of the contractor and what they did was they were asked to carry out a risk assessment of the building. You know, this, this is not any other building. This is a very distinct and, and special building with its own construction and constraints and materials. Um, so what they were asked to do was make an assessment, carry out a risk assessment of that. And once they'd done that, to prepare their fire safety plan. Um, and that's what they did. They then issued that uh, um, to the team and to the client uh, for comment. Um, and that document was revised three times in, in the, the following months. Um, it was revised firstly um, uh, after consultation with the, with the GSA, and that was entirely reasonable because they, uh, they were operating um, properties all around that, uh, all, all around the building. Um, so, so they, they, uh, they entered into a discussion ab about escape from other buildings, etc., and, neighbor, and neighbours. Um, so it was revised after that, that discussion. There was then further discussions um, with the design team and the project managers, and it was revised again. And then finally it was revised after discussion with building control and the fire services. Uh, a meeting was arranged on site and a walk round was carried all out of the whole building uh, together with these. And after that, the first, uh, there was an agreed list of, ch of uh, changes to the, um, to the fire safety plan, which was then adopted. All of these were adopted um, and, and the final version was issued by Keir Construction. Okay. I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, in terms of our interface with the, the school, um, the, we, we had the normal um, operating procedures with the, with the design team and the rest of the project team. There was nothing unusual for this kind of job. And indeed, um, probably the school had gone a step beyond that in that they had a couple of their own project managers who um, came to all the meetings, came to all the um, project reviews, project sessions that we had. Um, we don't always see that in other projects, but in this project they had two very experienced uh, project managers with um, heritage background work. So uh, I would say that was a kind of extra step that, that was taken that, that, that certainly we appreciated. Um, to touch on the, the issues in the fire plan um, and the, the, the site safety measures, um, we all have a, a, a duty. There's, there's, there's obligations upon us all, um, and those obligations overlap. So. Under the regulations, the client has a duty. Um, we have a duty to put the fire plan together and the construction phase plan. And the architects and, and, and other consultants have a duty to um, carry out checks on that as well. And all of that was done, as you hear the, the detail. Um, there was a lot of detailed work, detailed um, reviews and assessments carried out before the, the, the plans were signed off and um, activities started. I just ask, so the emergency, the, the fire plan that you've described, once that went through the consultation phases with the various partners and it was agreed, was it then a fixed document? It wasn't a dynamic document. So you've described it's been a complex project. The plan didn't change. And another question linked to that is, do you think what you have to um, prepare in the plan, which is regulatory, is adequate to deal with the type of project that the Macintosh was, it seems, am I correct in saying that the fire plan is focused around health and safety, around protection of uh, population, around excess, th those kind of issues, and not so much around how you deal with protection of a building. It, it prioritises people over buildings. Is that a correct...? That, that's fair to say, because that's what the Code of Practice sets out, that the, the priority is always people. Um, so, for example, you have to test, the, there are the requirements to test the procedures. They're tested, has to be no more than three monthly periods, as were tested more regularly than that because of um, the kind of building we were in. 
Um, we, in the last test that happened, I think in May 14, uh, uh, sorry, May 18, um, the building was emptied in something like four, mil uh, four minutes. So those tests give you that first priority, which is uh, preserving life. And then the second priority is obviously the asset protection um, and the building itself. Um, and that's what the fire plan uh, is, is geared to do okay. and all the measures that are put in place. Um, the one thing I would say is it's not a static document and it can't be because on complex jobs um, like the Macintosh, things have to change by nature of the construction project. So it gets revisited over time and it gets updated. So if we move the scaffolding, for example, or um, close an area, it gets updated. And it has to be communicated to the people on site. We have a board on site uh, at standard practice so that people who walk into that site can see that. It's interesting, in closing, it's interesting you talk about the project managers that came to the Art College because the impression I feel that after the initial, after the fire, the recent fire, was that Glasgow Art College didn't really have a responsibility in terms of the project. They, they seemed to, the comments that came out seemed I think that's to simply not recognise the extent that they, they seem. You're suggesting this morning they were quite, they were intimately involved in the absolutely. construction project and how that all developed in terms of the day-to-day -day, um, operations and, and, and control of work on site. But I, I think probably the distinction to be made is that when a contractor takes possession of a site, um, we all ha we all have our own responsibilities. But ultimately, the contractor has responsibility for securing and protecting the site. That, 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 that there, there's no debate on that, yeah. but there can only be one, one party who has full responsibility. Can I just okay, come thank in you. supplementary to that? Because we've taken expert evidence um, uh, from um, conservation architects who, who point out exactly the point that Mr McQuaid's just made, that the statutory requirements of the fire plan are about getting people out. Um, and that that's a failing in the statutory requirements for historic buildings. So what did yourselves as the architects in Glasgow School of Art do to come in and say, we want to enhance that fire plan to protect this incredibly precious asset, which is the Macintosh building? What we were working to, um, there is a, a, there's a standard um, code, joint, a joint code of practice, which, which the contractor referred to, earlier, that sets out the standards for work um, for fire prevention on, on uh, construction projects. And, and, and that's effectively the industry bible f um, for the work uh, that should be done on site to protect against. Uh, um, that was written into the tender documents um, and the contractor uh, took that into account in preparing his, his uh, fire uh, emergency plan. But incorporated in that code is a major focus on the asset, on prevention of hot works, permits for hot works, fire um, um, that's, that's works, to, works to steel work. There's, there's, there's a whole series of issues incorporated in it. Life safety must come first, but the building is protected within that, with, within that code, is described within that code. That's still a priority. A, a one of the, the pieces of advice we've been given by the experts is that compartmentation is quite difficult to build in um, during the restoration works, but you must do it. You must spend the money to build in compartmentation um, during the construction phase. Did you, did you do that in the fire well, plan? Can, did can you I, insist can I, can on I, that? While we identify that the contractor has the responsibility of the site, there has to be a single point of, of contact. The project managers, the design team, our health and safety advisor and a clerk of works monitor throughout that, the project what is actually happening on site. So there is, that's the role that the, that the design team has in, in response to, to, to the works that are, are, are going on. Okay, with a supplementary Specifically from... on, on compartmentation, I think what um, the building plan divides itself into three parts. And, and at these two third points, if I might describe it as that, um, there were f fire doors, temporary fire doors put in place th throughout the height of the building, um, and, and they stayed in place throughout the course of the works. Eventually, they would have been replaced with new fire screens, 
but throughout the course of, of the works, every time we went down one of the corridors, we were going through fire doors. Got a supplementary from Sandra Sorry. White. Thank you, Chair. It was to follow up on the risk assessment and in your proposals 2015-2016, you mentioned about areas of insulation being put in the roofs. So when you looked at the risk assessment, what material was used in the insulation in the roofs? Do you have the name of it? Um, the material um, that was used? I can't give you the specific um, manufacturer here, here and now, but um, I, I understand why you might ask the question. In the, in the context of, of Grenfell, there's been lots of discussion uh, held, held about uh, in the media uh, and, and within... So, sorry for interrupting. Would you know what it was? Surely you must have known. No, absolutely. Maybe in the contract. So can yes, you tell yeah. the committee yes, what, what it was? What I'd, what I'd do is explain to you um, where the insulation was used in this building. We've spent our career, well, the no, beginning of our sorry, career... I know it was used, and I'm taking up time, others want to come in on, it was used in the roof space, but there is pointing that certain insulation cannot be used in certain cavities unless it's with concrete. Uh, I just want to know what the insulation was, okay. and then I suppose we could look at it further. Of course, I, I can tell you the context afterwards, but to answer your particular question, it, um, it was a type of PIR insulation, mm -hmm. um, and the manufacturer states on that that the product will not contribute to the development stages of a fire or present smoke or toxic hazard if it is built in in the way that we did, which was to encapsulate it. Without yeah. an air gap. There was no air gap. So I, I can explain... It, it, it does mention certain ones that was used, not just in Grenfell, but obviously yeah. not far yeah, from yeah, the yeah, school. Yeah. In the harbour development in my constituency, mm -hmm. yeah. it has to be in a duct with concrete so that it that, doesn't... Uh, that isn't flammable. It depends on what it was used. If we, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so it was a PIR one. I can certainly check that out. You know, I don't want to take up the whole of the committee's time on this, but it would be interesting to know what it was exactly, well, uh, what type it was. Well, we're, I'm, I'm unable to give you that right I now. But, is but the we, one that was used in Grenfell. But we can give you that. I don't know if it's the same I, one I think what's there. important, if you will allow me to, 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 to say a little bit more about it, um, it's... I think it's absolutely important to distinguish in the uses of insulation at Grenfell because it, everything becomes conflated in, in, in media discussion. Grenfell was a concrete tower which was having an overcladding applied to, to that. So it was a composite panel um, was being applied. Behind that panel was insulation and behind that was an air gap and as we understand it, fire started within the building, got into that air gap, and was able to travel up th um, by igniting. Um, now, what we have here at, at the School of Art is completely different. Um, it, it's more akin to the insulation that you might expect to have in your house. What we have is uh, a, an existing envelope, which is stone, and then, and, and then internal linings. Normally, we, we, we look to add insulation to external walls. Here, we could not add any to external walls. The internal fabric was of such quality. So, so we couldn't disturb that. Where, we're, where we were able to add um, to approximately 50% of, of the roof was on the flat areas. And there, we were replacing the asphalt buildup. And the asphalt buildup um, system that we used included some insulation um, and, and, and but as I say that was encapsulated and therefore um, according to the manufacturer um, would not cause a risk so, do you just, I'm good. so therefore when you did the fire safety that was handed over to the contractor this was not deemed to be a risk that you were putting this type of insulation into the building correct Thank you, Chair. We're going to have to move on. Annabelle Ewing. Sorry. You can be here. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, sort of going back to the issue of, of um, you know, the, the site and, and, and who's in charge and all the rest of it. After fire number two, uh, Glasgow School of Fire reportedly said that at the time of that fire, the Macintosh was not part of GSA's operational estate and was in the management and control of Care Construction Limited. Perhaps, initially, Mr McQuaid could 
say to the committee what he thinks that statement means because we find it a wee bit perplexing. Um, I think it's probably Glasgow School of Art would have to explain what they meant since, um, since they, they, they wrote this statement. Um, what we took from it as, as the building contractor was um, exactly as had been said earlier on, that we were in possession of uh, the site, which is completely standard practice uh, in any building contract. Um, this was a traditional contract, um, so you know it was used for very many types of contracts, um, similar to, 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 to the, the Macintosh project. So us having possession of the site um, was absolutely how we understood that. Um, when they say it wasn't part of their operational estate, they were still the owner of the project. Um, they were still the owner of the building. They still had their duties under the, the regulations as client, as we did as principal contractor, and as Paige Park had as principal designer. So that's what we took. We were in possession of the site. That's what we took from uh, the school's statement. I think, anything to add? I, I, I think simply all that was meant by that, it wasn't part of their operational, as in it wasn't an operating school at that point. It was out, you know, it was a construction site. So you take site. it to mean that it actually wasn't, you know, functioning part of the the day-to-day -day life day, of I, I, school I as the educational that's establishment I, that's rather all I would than take from issues that. of ownership and having a beneficial interest in ensuring that things that happen in your own property are proceeding in a, in a reasonable way. It, if that then is, is the position, um, as beneficial owner, which of course they, they continued to be, um, reference has been made to the fact that they attended regular meetings. Could we have a bit more information? So what were these, was there a kind of generic name for these meetings as a grouping? Who attended these meetings? How regularly were these meetings held? Yeah. And were minutes taken of each meeting? Perhaps you could. Yes, I'm happy to explain that. That, that that's a very, uh, it's a very rigorous process once you start on site um, with a contractor um, in, in terms of reporting and monitoring of, of the work that's going on. So uh, on a complex job like this, there are many, uh, many and various meetings. Um, the, the principal meeting is a monthly progress meeting um, uh, at which the, the client and their, uh, by that I mean their project manager representatives, um, the external project managers, the whole design team and the contractor are present. And the contractor comes, prepares a, a report and presents that to the meeting um, and then there's a set agenda that, that, that we go through on that. These minutes are always taken, absolutely and crucial. Are these minutes now in the public domain? I, I, I don't know if they're in the public domain, but they are available. Okay. I, when, I, when was the last meeting before fire number two? Do you recall? Um, I can't give you the date, but... Uh, Again, what that I, should be information that yeah, is... Absolutely. What, what I was going to, going to go Sorry. on and say is that's just one of the types of, of meetings that are held. Um, on a weekly basis, there were technical meetings. Through their project manager or assistant project they, manager or their Theobald and uh, Gardner, Gardner and Theobald. Gardner and Theobald. Both, both, both would be at these. Okay. Um, so, so there were many technical meetings. There were um, services meetings and then there were... Uh, a, a whole host of specific trades meetings where we were talking about, say, stonework, or we were talking about windows, or, or you know, or, or, or uh, fire suppression, or so there, there, were, there were very, very intensive meetings, and these were minuted. Okay, so, so it, uh, if, 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 sorry, I'll come in back to you in a minute, but if, if they kind of phraseology operational state and being part or not part of that was uh, intended to have another meet uh, meaning on the part of others uh, as far as the actual reality of the situation was concerned. GSA through its various representatives were actively participating it seems even on a weekly basis in a daily, a daily, a daily basis daily you say basis. in all aspects of the Absolutely. operational uh, they, they, uh, nature of the construction This was process. their special building. They weren't going to just hand it over and say, come back later and, and show us it. Okay. So, Ms McQuaid, sorry I interrupted you. No, I just I was, I was going to agree with what David said there. It was a, it was a daily, um, in fact, up until a few months ago, um, the, the, the project managers from Glasgow School of Art had, had a, an office on site. Things were moving around and uh, by nature of that, they moved uh, to, to a building just not far away from the site. 
So there was, with our team, um, with the, the technical team, very often daily meetings, um, because you'd have the, the, the site daily things that had to happen, and then you'd have the regular sessions with the subcontractors, because they had to happen to allow us to progress things. And then we had the regular weekly and monthly meetings that are all programmed and scheduled. And the reasons for those is so that we know we've got the information to progress things and decisions are getting taken. OK, one last question, Convener. Um, I, I note from the submissions that there's a, a set of other people here, uh, players here. So you've got uh, GSA, it's project team, it's uh, Gardner and Theobald. You have Keir, you have subcontractors. Uh, reporting to Keir, but you have another set of people who were directly appointed, it appears, by GSA, being specialists, uh, conservators and craftsmen. How did they fit into this process in terms of what they were doing? Who was dealing with the oversight of what they were doing on site? Uh, there, were, uh, there were very few of these on, on, on site. Um, on site in terms of the work that they were doing, who, how did they fit into this daily, exactly. weekly, exactly. monthly As David process? Says, <clears throat> there was very few on site. A lot of these uh, would be things that were getting perhaps manufactured off site directly or, or refurbished. The there were a few on site. So who was in charge of, you know, well, generally their how, oversight? Yeah, how, how that works is because the police they order direct with them if they if they want, and it was very minor things. I mean, there weren't, there weren't um, to my knowledge. Um, many major um, issues that they, they, they did direct. Where they are done direct, um, there is a requirement because we're principal contractor, when they are on site, they have to come through our processes and procedures. They cannot come on site unless we've agreed that they can be on site. To do that, there's a, a, a real rigorous process that they have to go through for anything that they do on site. They have to be inducted, first of all. They then have to go through point of work risk assessments and method statements, and all of that has to be submitted and signed off um, by us principally. But we do take the technical advice of others. But there weren't, there weren't many instances of um, those direct. Um, okay, it was just it was another site. piece of information yes. that we hadn't been aware of, but that's helpful. Thank you, um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Uh, can I just clarify then? Um, so the contract uh, was signed, and. Keir became the you took ownership of the building. Contractor yeah. when, when we signed the contract, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the GSA, um, they, they obviously had well daily meetings and had someone there. So uh, notwithstanding obviously kind of what had just been discussed, uh, can you provide kind of some other detail just regarding any formal structures that were actually put in place um, between obviously yourselves and the GSA to actually have that rigorous analysis? of what was taking place uh, on, a, on a daily basis, well, on a regular basis. In terms of reporting processes? Yes. Yeah. I, I think um, what we said earlier on with David is pretty much how the reporting process works. So you have your daily activities that are going on by the various trades. They're collated on a daily basis, so we know where we are. They're then put into the, the overall programme that's updated on a regular basis. And that's reviewed at the regular meetings that we have now. Um, those, those are monthly in terms of the progress meetings, or if we need them in between, we, we could have them in between, they wouldn't be called a progress meeting. <laughs> so that's a, a, a regular session that happens where um, we need um, other meetings away from that. They also um, are scheduled and happen because when we're procuring um, the works and there's a rigorous procurement process has to be gone through, um, um, maybe just diverse for a mom moment, if you don't mind, because whilst this was a traditional contract, the way it was being procured, um, there was two parts to it. The first part was a, a fixed part to allow the, the job to get started, which was um, a reasonably small sum in the overall. The rest of it was then done on a two-stage basis where we would take the information um, from the designers and tender that in the open market. And the, the reason for that was to allow an open book process so that they could see the costs coming back. When you go beyond that and choose the subcontractors that are going to work on the site, they then fall into a, a procurement schedule and uh, the orders are placed, the subcontract orders are placed but in agreement with the, the client team. So we would agree with uh, the architect, engineer, um, any orders to be placed. So there was a process that went through and that happened on almost a, an ongoing basis and those, those reporting processes, the monthly report would capture all of it. 
and then there would be a, an ongoing process if, if something was falling behind we would have a, a, a mechanism to go back and say we need some information or this has gone behind we would like to adjust how we're doing something now that's that's there's nothing unusual about that on on a contract it's good practice and i think that's what we did we followed good practice Can I just add this a, a slight overlay that yeah it's got also a point of the clerk of works and that clerk of works gave a report every week with images and text to describe the works on site and the procedures being followed so that was appointed directly to the art school as another layer of uh, 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 inspection. Okay, notwithstanding what you just said, uh, we heard uh, from uh, uh, Malcolm Fraser when he gave evidence to the committee, uh, and uh, he indicated that uh, the GSA should have put in place structures around the contract that required the main contractor, not just ourselves, to look after the construction and design management, health and safety, proper procurement for the contract, employment practice and other such things. Those structures are in place, but I want to talk about the adequacy of those structures. So, um, what was what was missing? Um, I don't believe there was anything missing in the, the process that, that, that was adopted. It was a traditional contract and it followed um, good practice in terms of the meetings. I, I, I couldn't actually properly answer that, I'm afraid, because I, I don't actually know what he's referring to there. Okay. I think if, if I, we're, we're talking about the fire, so I, I think I would take you back to the process that, that, that went, the contractor went through and the consultation process that, that occurred with, with all of the best authorities. You know, we, we consulted with building control and fire services. Um, so I, I, I think that process was, um, was absolutely crucial to setting the fire plan at the beginning and then running it. And, and, and thereafter, it was a question of monitoring that the fire plan was, was, was being adjusted and progressing. I just want to ask one further question that's in a separate area, and that's regarding um, the response uh, on the evening. And certainly, there were accusations that no fire alarm was heard uh, by local residents, and also concerns about the, the level of staff that were on site. Um, what would you like to, uh, to say to, uh, to the, the concerns that have legitimately been raised by residents in the area? Um, I, I wasn't there on the evening, unfortunately, um, so I can't comment whether you know, I heard the fire alarm or not. What I can say is the systems were all in place and tested. Um, I can't comment on what was heard or not heard that evening, I'm afraid. It's, it's speculation I've heard. Um, you know, speculation on a number of things. Um, I don't wish to be unhelpful, but just the systems have been tested and were working. Um, I've no reason to believe that they weren't. When was, the, describe the systems. Sorry, sorry, when was the last time they were tested before the fire? They're, they're generally tested on a weekly basis. I know uh, that there was certainly a, um, a, a, a fire alarm procedure on 14th of May, I think it was, which would have been a few weeks before. But so you everybody, just was of, everybody was um, taken out through the whole process, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, and ev evacuated from the building. Yeah, you just said a moment ago that they're tested on a weekly basis, but if that was the 14th of May, well, that was also a number of weeks before the fire. Yeah, no, uh, that's, that's what I'm saying. The full one, though, where, where you evacuate the building happened that day, so I know that that was a, a, a one that was recorded. Um, the, 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 the systems are tested um, on a weekly basis and, and reported as such. Um, the, the, the panels themselves show if there's any faults and, and, and they're visible. So, you know, the, the, the team can see that on the panel if there's anything wrong. Um, so that, that, that would have, that would have thrown, thrown up if there was a fault. Okay. What I could add is, the, uh, um, is what the, the, the procedure that was set out in, in the contractor's fire and emergency plan was that there was a guard on site overnight. Um, the, the, um, there was a 24-hour security monitoring. Um, there was a, a, a fire watch patrol every hour, um, and records were, were to be kept of that. Um, if a fire occurred, then the, the guard 
was to immediately uh, advise the fire services, then advise the uh, care management, and then advise the GSA. Um, and then if a fire tender arrived, he was to meet them uh, in the street, tell them where the fire was, where the fire panel was, and the quickest route to the fire. Now, that, that's what was set out as a procedure. What I can't say is what happened that night, um, but that, that's what the procedure was. Thank you, Convener. After the first fire, Glasgow School of Art met with um, Windsor Castle and York Minister uh, to see what uh, lessons had been learned from their fires. So what was learned and how was it applied to the Macintosh building? I think that the, the learning that came out of these considerations was the, the five measures that I, that I mentioned earlier, I don't, I, I don't want to go back through them unnecessarily, but these were the key protections that were going to protect this building in the future. Uh, and, and, and again, I would clarify, I'm talking about the completed building. Once all of these were in place, these five measures were, were the ones that were going to protect this building. But clearly the five measures weren't in place at the time of the fire. I think that's probably why we're here, uh, here uh, just now. Can I ask uh, what role uh, Historic Environment Scotland actually played in the management and restoration of the management site, if any? Histor Historic Scotland and the City Planning Department have been intimately involved throughout our 25 years of involvement with the, and commitment to the, to the MAC. When we started in the 1990s, I think the view very much was you replace as is. So we replace the roofs, so you don't, you don't enhance systems. What emerged in the 2000s was because of the Federal Fire Report, it was, it was clearly seen that, that enhancement systems were required. And it was innovative at the time. It just, you just don't go and put fire sprinkler systems through, through buildings. Historic Scotland were adaptable and flexible together with the city plan to say we think we understand the risks and therefore in this particular instance we need to look at, the, at those improvements. So in that respect they were flexible to, to adapting the Macintosh building to, to, to improve it. Subsequent to the post 2014 fire they were part of the, the city planning were part of the process in terms of all the detail and again another overview of what we were doing in terms of, of building what we, a set of drawings in the form of a digital model which showed that the, 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 the building in immense, in immense detail. Okay, thank you. Ross Green. Thanks, Convener. I'd like to just tease out a little bit more around the, the fire safety plan. Um, perhaps Mr McQuaid would be best to answer this. Um, you've explained how there was quite extensive consultation. Every key stakeholder was involved, including site visits um, in the lead up to it. When it came to ultimate sign-off of the fire safety plan, is it ultimately for CARE to decide whether or not the plan is agreed and goes forward, or is there a, a collective agreement before the document is considered to be live? It has to be a collective agreement because each party has duties under the regulations, so we can't just say this is what we're doing. That's useful. Uh, so there was, I believe, a, a press statement from yourselves um, relatively shortly after the, the second fire, but um, it appeared as if that statement was prompted by the two previous ones that came from the School of Art themselves, which appeared to distance them from management of the site, going back to the, the um, phraseology around operational control of the estate that Annabelle uh, Ewing brought up. It, it wouldn't be fair or accurate, would it, for the School of Art to attempt to distance themselves from site management or project management during this process? Um, I think the School of Art would have to, to respond to that. I don't um, think it's appropriate for me to respond to that. I think we worked with uh, the school, we worked with the team that set out they wanted a collaborative approach, and I think that's very much what um, what happened in the, the two, two, two years we were involved in it. Um, the reason we issued a statement um, after the two statements by Glasgow School of Art was not in reaction to their um, statement, it was in reaction to, uh, as you can appreciate at that time, there was a huge amount of interest in people trying to get information and we were asked for information and we, we felt the simplest thing to do was 
issue the factual statement, uh, which is what we tried to do, because the fire strategy was in place, the systems were in place, we had agreed um, well in advance all the, uh, the steps that had to be taken, and we looked at what was appropriate for the job, because it's a special job. Thank you. Uh, to look, take this point wider and perhaps looking at before uh, both fires or the future of the building, future of the site, is there tension between having a functioning art school and a building that is also essentially a, a major public attraction where you're trying to uh, wrestle with two quite different purposes? One is as a working art school with everything that comes with that, and the other is the quite substantial footfall that you get from being a a major public attraction. Is there tension between those two that can make um, fire safety and other safety challenges perhaps more compounded than they otherwise would have been? I think there's possibly two sides to that, that, that question. Sorry, from, from our side, from the construction side, um, no, we, we put all the measures in place. I can't um, really say about the um, point that David will probably um, address. Well, the art school as a physical building is, is the, the most amazing building to, for an artist to have an education. Anyone you speak to who has been educated there can't help but say they've been incredibly stimulated by that environment. That brings with it the challenges that people want to go in to see it as well. And the art school have created a management system and part of the process of the development of the proposals in the last f four years before the, the second fire were about how that should be managed. As part of the conservation and access statement, what they did was they took out the reception area into the new adjacent Reed building. So that's where you gather people, and then in an orderly fashion, you process through the building at certain times. That allowed the school to operate at the same time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Did you have a supplementary, Sandra White? was a supplementary, sorry, Chair, is that all right? It's very quickly. Very quickly. Uh, you mentioned about the 24-hour security and monitoring and hourly, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if that was just by camera or people on foot. Uh, are the, all of these things reported because we did hear there are people here today who say there was no, they didn't hear the fire alarm at all. So therefore, when you had your weekly or daily or whatever meetings, are these things reported, so-and-so went round, fire alarm is working, et cetera, et cetera. Would the committee be able to get access to these reports? Uh, I, I mentioned there earlier that there was a, a regular progress meeting mm -hmm. um, and at which the contractor prepared a progress report. He submitted that beforehand. Um, at at the, the very first point on that report um, dealt with fire and health and safety. So he reported on that ev every month giving a statement of, of how that was going. And I would, so that it was, it was uh, uppermost in people's minds throughout. I'm sorry and, to and, and ev you every again, time. But are, are these minuted? Are yes, they, they are, they are minuted. Um, and what I would say is um, every one of these minutes all the way through records that the system is, is working. It records that the system is being checked. Um, and in fact, there was only one occasion where, where it, it, it mentioned anything else, and it said that the alarm had gone off. Um, it was found to be a false alarm, um, and, and other than that, it, it was reported night, every month as working. On the night working. of the fire, we be should be able to see, as the security went round, they checked X, Y, and Z. That should be reported to, to the meetings. I, I believe that the fire service will have that information. That the only thing I could caution there is that, that, that that's something that just, we would have to um, well, obviously defer to, to them the, on it. To the committee, the convener, if they want that information. On the fire alarm, a new fire alarm was part of the contract, installing it. Um, at the time of the fire in 2018, were you operating with the new fire alarm or still the old one? We were operating with the, the one that was for the temporary arrangements, um, because the, the new one, we were 10 months away. So similar to the sprinkler installation, it was still part of the building process. There was a lot of pipes and wires being put into the building, as there was with um, um, you know, a lot of the other finishing works, plaster work ceilings um, that, was, that was ongoing at the time. The alarm system. So it wasn't the old one or the new one, it was a temporary one? Yeah, that, that, that what happens on projects when we do this fire assessment and when we do the, um, the fire safety plan and the construction phase health and safety plan, 
we then bring certain things to the project. Now, the project um, had a temporary fire alarm, so it's not temporary, it's, I mean, it's a full-blown system, but it's for the period of the, um, the project works. And that's, that's a standard process. Members have told us that you know the fire alarm has went off regularly and it was le regular false alarms, but in the last month before the fire, it didn't go off at all. Could you comment on that? The the the, the, I can't the suggestion comment. being that it may have been shut off. No, I can't, I can't was, comment uh, on the last part about it not having that at all. There there were um, occasions when on sites these systems will trigger because the dust triggers the detector. Um, so, so there is instances when that will happen. They're recorded. Right. So, can you tell us now, assure us that there was the fire alarm system was not turned off because of these these false alarms? Fire alarm system. There's a, an operational process there every day. Um, the the <coughs> panel um, is just as you go in the door, so you can see the lights are on. What I'm so saying is, you didn't disable the fire alarm because of these false alarms, did you? No, the, the, Can you categorically assure us that you didn't do that? There are times on the site there are different uh, detectors. You have CO2 detectors, beam detectors and heat detectors. There are times when operations are getting carried out and there is a, a method statement put in where they'll be switched off for that period. So that, that, that does happen. It does happen. Did it happen at the time of the fire? Well, it happened... At different stages, I, c I couldn't say today that that particular day that it would have been off. I can't right. imagine that it so would it have been. So it may have been off? I can't imagine it would have been because there's an operational process surely, that has uh, it on. Surely you must have asked your people on site. I mean, you previously said in the answer to Sandra White's question that you didn't really know much about the night of the fire. Did you ask if the fire alarm had been disabled on the day of the fire? Have you asked your people that? We have asked uh, our staff that. And what did they tell you? It was operational. It was uh, as operational as it was every day. Right. And how can how can you check that? Well, I think that's part of the the investigation that the fire service is, is going through at the moment. Okay. Thanks very much, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Camilla. You've talked about the the risk assessments. You've talked about the policies and the procedures. Uh, that everything was in place that would ensure that if a situation occurred, uh, that there was there was policies to happen. Uh, but it's quite apparent that that didn't happen. If, if they had been fit for purpose and everything had been working accordingly and properly, uh, then we wouldn't have had such a devastating fire uh, in the situation. You've also talked about individuals who were on site at the time, uh, you know, and they, have, they were given training, they were given support mechanisms, all of that. Uh, so why then did we have such a catastrophic situation uh, that, that, that the community and the school uh, believe that there, there were there were possibly uh, failings taking place in the process? Well, I, I can't really comment on uh, what the failings are. There's an investigation going on, and what I can say is we are as, as keen as everybody else to know, because all the processes and procedures that were appropriate and, and the extra steps that were taken were all in place and had all been operating for two years. So we are as keen to understand as, as everyone else as to what's, what's happened. And the, the oversight of the management of health and safety on the site, you've, you've indicated who had roles and responsibilities for that. And you are you're all clear that all of that was taking place and all of that was measured and all of that was in place. Yes, we had all, uh, all the checks in place. We had the construction health and safety plan was in place. The fire risk assessments were in place. The fire plan was in place. It had been updated um, to take account of the changes in the site. Um, it was all in place. Do the other panellists want to comment on that? Absolutely nothing to say to the contrary. Um, that, that's our understanding and that, that's what we saw day in, day out on site. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Thank you very much, Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Good, <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, could you just um, educate me in terms of protocol on a construction site? Who is responsible for the site at any given time? Uh, is it an individual? Is it an organisation? Um, and does it change depending on the time of day or what activity is taking place on site? 100% um, is from the day of that the, the contractor takes possession right through to completion. It's the contractor has sole responsibility for um, 
for, for these measures on site. Okay, when you say they contract, you mean the limited company which holds the contract? Your construction. Okay, and within that then, uh, obviously, if three in the afternoon, there'll maybe be a number of organisations or people on site, contractors, subcontractors, GSA, CARE, project managers, architects. Is it still the contract holder who is fully responsible for the site at that time? The prin principal contractor principal holds respons contractor. responsibility for the contract. Oh, okay. Uh, so just two weeks after the fire in 2018, there was a statement went out that that um, relationship had uh, ended, that contract had ended. Uh, could you just give us a little bit more detail as to why that decision was made so quickly and the circumstances around that joint statement with GSA and if that was an amicable decision? Uh, working in reverse, it was an, am an amicable decision. Um, we got to that point um, over those two weeks when there was... Uh, uh, as you can appreciate, we'd just been through one of the most devastating things. We're dealing with a whole host of things, including people who were devastated by what happened. Um, and the impact on the city and, and, and the community. There's a whole host of things, and, and we, we were involved in that. Um, we'd met with uh, Glasgow School and the design team just shortly afterwards um, to see what steps could be taken. Um, we'd met with the fire service. We continue to do that to, to make sure we can give whatever information uh, they need for the investigation. Um, the view was after a a 10-day period that it was unlikely we could ever actually fulfil the original contract. So the view was it would be better just to bring that contract to an end and that would allow then the school to uh, work around how they could go forward from there. Part of that was because possession of the site would have to be given to others and that seemed to us a sensible thing to do and it was, it was an amicable agreement. We didn't, there was no uh, exchanges other than professional exchanges to arrange the paperwork. Uh, thank you for that response. And can I ask, um, in our previous panel session on this, there was a lot of conversation around what should happen next. And I know the, the discussion today is very much around retrospective, look at the circumstances of the, the, the fires, uh, etc. But uh, having been so close to the project for such a long time, can I ask if anyone on the panel today has any personal views or corporate views on, on what should happen to the site and the school next? I think... I, uh, speak for Keir. Um, we, we, we don't feel we can have a kind of corporate view on it because it's something that the, the school and the art world really need to decide. And it's not that we're stepping back from it, but we think it's probably more appropriate that um, the school and the, the art world decide how it goes forward. And committee. Right. I uh, just wonder, it will be for others to determine what happens in, turn, in relation to, to the art school. But there were two questions that we would have had at the back of our mind. When we started on the project, a number of suggestions were made to me that we didn't have the skills in Scotland to do the reconstruction. I think the team that Keir pulled together and the subcontractor's commitment showed we do have those skills and they were doing a beautiful job. Something happened, but they were doing... A, a very beautiful job. The other question is, do we have the information to rebuild it? Post-2014, we were not sure, but we were overwhelmed with photographs from former members of staff, historic photographs, documentation, archives were found. We even found someone who'd taken a sneaky plaster cast of one of the details of the library, which we used for the reconstruction. He didn't want to be, his name to be known because it he, because he wasn't, it was illegal. <laughs> he wasn't meant to do that. And as, a, and as a result of that, we were able then to build a digital model to find a way to do it in a three-dimensional three way of all that information. So we, I think we have probably the most advanced information on an existing building anywhere in the world in terms of that documentation. So in answer to if the decision was taken now to reconstruct, we think we have that information. And part of that was we had an exchange with, for four years with an Erasmus school at a university, Nikos Kapunas in Poland. Their students came across. Half their time was spent measuring all the rooms that weren't damaged in the first fire. So that information, we didn't have that before. We had to, we had to go back to old drawings. We have the information to reconstruct if that is the decision. A supplementary from Annabelle Ewing. Yeah, 
supplementary in the sense of you're talking about potential reconstruction, and I suppose that on a timely basis brings us to the issue of the insurance policy, which was in the joint names of GSA and KEAR, I understand. I, I, I wish to clarify something. It was mentioned earlier in this evidence session that there was this five-point plan, which included missed suppression. How was that five-point plan reflected in any conditions in the insurance policy? I can't actually comment on the insurance policy. I think it's Glasgow is... Um, but it's jointly in the names of Keir and GSA. It's in joint names. We, we don't make a claim on it. It's, um, it's no, but if you had, you know, if it's in policies and joint names, you both had to be signatories to the policy. Uh -huh. So presumably somebody read the policy before Keir yes, signed uh, it. Yeah. Pardon me? Yes, we were, we were joint so names on it. how then does the five-point plan, you know, including the mis misuppression condition, how does that get reflected in the insurance policy? Was it reflected? Was it not reflected? Was it about to be reflected? Yeah, I, I think we would have to... I mean, I would have thought it would be very important to ensure that you feel confident that the insurance policy will cover this catastrophic event. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hesitating because there's two different things. The insurance policy was for the period of the construction. The misuppression system was for... The finished product. Okay, finished and in the period of construction, what kind of conditions were imposed? Were they the statutory minimum or were the add on conditions? Notwithstanding that, of course, there had already been a fire. Can you comment on that? I, I can't comment on the detail, um, I'm afraid. Um, I don't have the detail and I would need to go back and, and ask someone okay. with the detail of the policy. Is that something in terms of? Park and Page's kind of knowledge yeah. generally that well, you would know whether they were kind of add-on conditions because obviously you're looking at an insurance policy that was taken out not just you know a, a sort of average run of the, the mill insurance policy it was taken out after there had already been a catastrophic fire so I, it begs we, the question would there have been any add-on conditions imposed we, in the insurance we were policy? not party to the details of the this, the agree the insurance um, but um, uh, and I'm not aware that there were any specific requirements that came from the insurance policy that had to be applied on site. What we were being asked to do was to use, um, to, 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 as I, I said before, just go through that process of full risk assessment and pre prepare an appropriate fire and emergency plan. Um, it, that, that, that's all I can say, and that's, that's what was done. So it remains to be seen whether both the plan and the insurance policy reflected any uh, requirements beyond the minimum statutory requirements. That remains well, uh, I, I think to be we clarified have, by somebody. I think we would have known about that. I think the policy is there. Um, it's, I can't answer the detail of the policy today, I'm afraid. Um, I don't have the, the detailed knowledge of the insurance um, aspects. Um, I know the headlines of it, but I think it would be wrong. Um, but, but the information should be able to be provided. Um, Glasgow, Glasgow School, I'm sure, would be able to provide that when they come. What I would say is that the, when, I, uh, when I referred earlier to the joint code of practice that, that governs the, the, the actions, um, the, the fire prevention actions, the, the, the joint code actually refers to um, the, um, the British the Association of British Insurers, they are joint authors of that document. So what we, in, in this instance, would say is that if we're working to that, we are, we are normally covering all the issues that an insurance company would require. If there were over and uh, beyond requirements, we would have known about that. That, that would have been a, an obligation placed upon the contractor to respond. It's reflected in the detail of the contract. At the time you sign it, um, it's just a lot of detail and it was... Um, Something just don't and have ask to do. the GSC, yes. as you say, Mr. McQuaid, when they come. So we've already heard that that you know those fire that the fire safety plan that you have to put in place, the statutory regulations, are not adequate um, for any historic building. Because I think what what we're asking is what extra that you put in, given the precious nature of this building, because the fire safety regulations are about evacuating people, not about preserving precious assets. The joint code of practice is, is um, the minimum standard that's used for the insurance one minimum, as well. Yeah, but we're talking about you know a unique cultural treasure here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can can I just? Then became part of a crucial part of 
what the art school in terms of project managers ourselves and what we were seeing on site with our, we were there regularly. Yeah, just in terms of what you did, you know, um, to protect the building, can I just go back to my first question? Like, we know about these ducts, um, how, how dangerous they were. Some of them were just still being in place because the, not the whole building was destroyed in 2014. Did you take immediate measures to ensure that that issue with the ducts was dealt with at an early stage in the construction project? wasn't done um, at that stage um, because these ducts were going to be used for um, uh, the routing for all the services. And then at the end of that process, they were going to be fire stopped. So, so, so that, that right, was that's really interesting. Yeah, that was absolutely part of that five point plan. So, so during the whole construction phase, the, the thing that accelerated the fire in the first place, that problem was kept in place. And we know that during uh, construction works of historic buildings, they're, a very, they're very, very vulnerable. But you kept the ducts in place. You didn't deal with the fire stopping immediately. It's, it, was still, it still remained a conservation project. Yeah. So that we, we were unable to build new ducts or new distribution systems. We had to use the systems, that, the, 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 the circulation that was there. Did anyone from the art school raise that with you as an issue? We've already heard that the art school had a project manager and all sorts of people were supervising it. Did anybody step in and ask the question that I'm asking now? Why didn't you stop the fire in those ducks? What can we do to ensure that the building's safe during the, the re reconstruction? Well, what was done, we must remember that throughout the course of the works, the contractor put in a full detection system. There, there, was, a, there was a significant process put in place to protect the building at um, that point yeah. um, and, and the inspections, etc. At the time of the fire... Well, the, actually, the, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt and I don't want to be rude, but we don't have much time left. Did anyone from the... The question I'm asking you is, did anyone from the art school, the client, step in at any point and say, we need to deal with these ducts that caused the previous fire to accelerate now? We need to deal with them at an early stage. Did anyone from the art school step in and tell you to find a way to do that? I, I don't recall that. Uh, they were very much part of understanding what the build process is. And these ducts were being used for pipe work and for cables. And they were, uh, at the time of the fire, all of that installation was ongoing. So there was a myriad of cables and pipes g going up through, the, through these spaces, um, which would be closed off in due course. Yeah, but they still left the building at, at risk. Which yeah. is not, not unusual in the construction fees for those areas to be. It may not be, be unusual, but obviously it's resulted in this but building possibly of, um, being well, completely well, destroyed. As, as part of the construction process that had to be open, we could not um, actually yeah. put the wires for the final system and the, the steelwork pipes for the final okay. system in without them being open. Right. My final question is in, in April 2018, uh, Professor John Cole. Uh, brought out a report in Keir, into Keir's work in DG1, a leisure centre in Dumfries. Um, he's obviously a, a very respected expert, and uh, he was extremely critical of Keir's work on that building, and he was extremely critical of the fire stopping in that building. Um, it was a pretty devastating report, and I understand that you made a settlement, uh, Mr McQuaid, um, with Dumfries and Galloway Council because of the inadequacy of your work on that building. Um, when you, the, it was widely publicised, um, not just in the specialist press, but also in the, the, the Scottish uh, press. Um, can I ask Paige and Park what you did as a result of the publication of Professor Cole's report? Did you, did you go back to Keir to make sure that they were uh, installing the adequate fire stopping and measures in, in, in Glasgow School of Art? Were you alarmed at all by Professor Cole's report? What I would take you back to is the, the whole procurement process um, for, for this project. The, the, it was a very rigorous process to select a contractor in, in the first place. Um, this was led by the GSA and their project managers. Um, a short list was drawn up um, and, and there was a, a rigorous questioning and, and scoring on that. And out of that came uh, a decision uh, to appoint Keir, 
who were uh, showed themselves to be appropriate. Uh, Your written submission, we've read all that. As I say, the clock's ticking here. I want to know what you did in 2018, in April 2018, in response to this devastating report about Kier, which mentioned fire stopping as an inadequate um, measure. What, what I said earlier is that we were uh, on Did site you do anything? On, a, on a daily basis. We were monitoring and, and watching the work that was going on, and we had no concerns. So you didn't raise you didn't raise Professor Cole's report. Did the art school raise Professor Cole's report? As far as I'm concerned, that, that was irrelevant to this, this contract. We were focused on the work that we were doing and making sure that what CARE were doing on site was, was correct. And all the reporting that was coming from the Clarker Works and, and our and overview was that work was being done properly. Okay. okay, can I thank all our witnesses today for coming uh, to give evidence? Uh, and we are now going to close and move into private session. Thank you very much.